Welcome back to Get Your Voice Out There. I'm Roberta Chatis, and I'm delighted to have an extraordinary guest today. I have Nancy, Clas Nancy Torgo Clasby as our guest, and she's going to be talking to us about a very wonderful book that she wrote, and it's called The Reluctant Mystic. This is a picture of the book. And I just want to start off, Nancy, with shaking your hand <laughs> and welcoming you to the show. Because after reading this book, I thought, I need to hear the story from you in person. I understand this book about your awakening, but I think our audience would really get a lot out of hearing it right from your mouth. So let's start with what happened to you and some of your thoughts on what that was all about and how you felt about it. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me here today, Roberta. I love you. <laughs> I love you too. We, we've known each other for many years, and I'm so grateful to be here with you. Thank you. Um, in 1996, I had an out-of-body experience that I later found out was called a spontaneous awakening. And at the time, I really didn't know what it was mm -hmm. uh, because it was an experiential experience, so it had no language in it. Um, but a lot of unusual things happened to me as a result of the awakening. And I knew within about the first year that I would write a book about it, write it down my story, because I felt like it was important enough to leave it as a gift for uh, people when I scoot along. <laughs> Absolutely. And so it took me a long time to write my story down because in a way it was similar to coming out of the closet because it was such an unusual story. I didn't want people to think that maybe I had gone crazy or should have been put in a mental institution, which does happen sometimes to people when they have awakenings of this great proportion. Now, I understand what you're saying because one of the, well, many of the experiences you had were so impossible to describe. You might want to start, I, I, I loved the part about how you were feeling when you were starting your family. And I thought we should bring up the first picture of you and your children yes. and start there. Yes. This first picture that you're showing is about the age that my children were when I had the awakening. Mm -hmm. My children were three, six, and nine at the time. And um, it was quite a lot for me to integrate into my life. And I remember at one point after the awakening, I was walking up the stairs with a an armful of laundry with little socks and they were all falling down. Everything was falling out of my arms. And I said, I sat down on the stairs and I started to cry. And I said, really? And I used the word God for that energy source that I believe moves the universe. I said, really, God, do you think you could pick someone else? Because can't you see I'm really, really busy right now? <laughs> and you, anyone that's ever been a mother or a father um, or a parent knows that it's an incredibly busy time of life. And what happened to me after the awakening was, um, well, first of all, I didn't eat or sleep for three months afterwards, which I know sounds crazy, but I was being fed by an energy source that was coming in through the top of my head and it was filling me and feeding me. And so I didn't have to eat or sleep for three months after the awakening. And I gained what they call clairvoyance, clairsentience, and clairaudience, the ability to see, feel, and hear things before they happened, mm -hmm. and a lot of other things that sound like hocus pocus that at the time when it was happening to me, I was in a state of bliss, um, and I accepted everything, but later on when I tried to intellectualize what had happened to me, I couldn't do it. It was like trying to fit the ocean in a thimble. It was the experience was so expansive that I could not intellectualize it. And it took me a long, long time to find language around it. And if you read about any of the great mystics or the people that have had 
awakenings, you'll mm. be able to see that they tell this, a lot of the similar stories in that it takes a long time to integrate it. It's almost like I was being downloaded, if you can yeah. put it in modern terms of a computer. It was like in that 45 minutes that I had the awakening where I left my body and went to this place of incredible incredible, incredible light and perfection mm -hmm. and a place of unspeakable beauty. I was downloaded with all of the wisdom of thousands and thousands and thousands of years of humanity. And so it took a long time for me to be able to integrate that. And at the same time, I was working you know, being a mother, a young mother. Yes. And really that's, I, I did not ask for this experience. It was an experience that happened all on its own. It unfolded inside of me naturally, but I had no idea previous intellectual knowledge about the experience. I had never met anyone that had had an experience. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know that kind of experience existed. Sure. I wasn't one that was taken to going to psychic fairs, not that there's anything wrong with that, mm -hmm. uh, but it just wasn't a part of my path. I had always lived a natural kind of holistic life, but I was not a seeker. And at the time I was so busy, I had no idea what I thought of that energy that I now call um, God. So you made it through the day, obviously. Barely. <laughs> and were you continuously having experiences yes. during that those three yes. months? Yes, uh, for many, many, for years, years. afterwards. Years afterwards. Um, a lot of things that sound very magical and maybe it's almost, um, you know, I'm a very pragmatic person. I'm very grounded in reality. Mm -hmm. I'm not one that is taken by flights, or fanciful thinking, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of very unusual things happened to me as a result. One of the things that happened to me was that I could put my hands on people, and much to my surprise, I could see inside their bodies. I could see broken bones. I could see cancer tumors. <laughs> I know. See, it doesn't sound like I'm, that doesn't sound like someone that's based in reality, but those were my experiences. I could look into people's eyes and I could see their souls. Mm -hmm. I could see what was missing and what was present. And I used to be able to see a ring around everyone's head. And in that ring of light, you know, when you look at pictures, ancient pictures of religious figures, yes. you see the halos yes, yes, around yes. their head. Well, that's what I would see. And I would see Around their heads, I would be able to see their jobs, their families, the car they drove, um, their, their homes, um, and all of the material things in the world mm -hmm. that would bring them together in a, as a human being. And then what would happen is the halos would evaporate and come down into nothing. And what would be left would be the love that they received and the love that they gave. Oh my God. And we start yeah. with the love of self. And then once we learn to see our own beauty and we learn to understand who we truly are, then we can move out into the world and love others and, and leave our gifts and plant seeds all around us. So when you're given this kind of a gift, and of course I'm trying to see a halo around you, you it's not working. <laughs> but I think a lot of us have what I would call an awakening, like a sudden awareness of something mm -hmm. that happens, you know, all of a sudden something clicks. M maybe these are little mini messages that many of us get from the energy in, in, the, in the earth and the universe. But obviously yours was a clear experience that was out of this world, I will say. <laughs> How's that? Yes. Pretty much out of this world. So when you have, I want to hear more about all of your experiences, but when you have something like this that happens to you, and this was 1996 to the present, uh, and I'm sure it continues, right? So... What do you do with all of this? How, what are you going to do to help our audience and, and uh, you know, make changes to our lives? Yeah, well, um, first of all, after about 10 years of living with all of these um, gifts that were given to me, I, I did ask for them to be taken away. 
I could see when someone was going to die. I could see the angel of death. Um, I knew when someone was getting ready to cross over. And those were things that I just didn't really want to know anymore. I didn't yeah. want to walk around and see everybody's stuff because it was none of my business, first of all, and it was overwhelming. Mm. So after about 10 years, and it's been about 25 years now, so after about 10 years, I did ask for those gifts to be toned way back and that skill set to be. Who do you be, ask for that? I, I asked the <laughs> spirit world. I asked God. I, I mean, I was in a continuous and still am in a continuous conversation with a power greater than myself, whatever okay. you choose to call that. And one of the things that I learned in that experience is it really doesn't, it doesn't matter what you call it. It yeah. can be called by so many different names and the language around it always falls short of the actual experience. But what happened to me was that I was um, given the gift of healing and I knew the first time that I laid my hands on someone, the laying, of hand, the laying on of hands, that I would do that for the rest of my life. I love, I have a healing practice that I've had for close to 25 years, and I absolutely adore being able to sit in silent meditation with another spirit and work on a physical, emotional, spiritual healing. Mm -hmm. Now, physical healings don't always happen. Sometimes they do, but there's always a healing of the spirit when you sit and you still the mind and you open the heart that's when divinity is able to come in and you can hear those messages. Mm. And it's interesting, as I sit here and talk <laughs> with you, I know the human brain gets distracted very often, mm. except I'm finding myself being very present and very um, focused on what you're saying and really listening to what you have to say without distraction which is highly unusual for me. <laughs> so something's working. And I know I have been to you and felt your, your, the heat. Tell, tell us a little about that Reiki. Is it Reiki? Well, you know what? I, I, I did the laying on of hands for the first five, maybe 10 years. And then mm. I went back to school and I learned about anatomy and physiology and lots of different energy techniques. So I'm a licensed reflexologist. I learned about an uh, energy technique called polarity, oh, yes. an energy technique called cranial sacral therapy, definitely Reiki. Um, I learned about a technique called metamorphosis, which works on calming the central nervous system mm -hmm. on the spinal column that um, in traditional Chinese medicine is represented in the hands and the feet. Mm -hmm. um, I also teach breathing. Um, I have a 40-year-old yoga practice. I started maybe, maybe longer. I started yoga when I was about 18, practicing yoga, and I'm 61 today, so I'm not sure I did the math right on that, but it's been a long time. Mm -hmm. So I do teach pranayama and simple breathing techniques to um, my clients when they come to lie down on my table. I always teach different short little meditation techniques for them. Mm -hmm. If someone's preparing for surgery, I can give them visualizations. If someone is going in for chemotherapy, I can give them breathing techniques to use. I've been teaching meditation one-on-one -on -one in small groups and large groups and even larger groups for a long, long time. And the reason I teach meditation is because I lived in a meditative state for many years after the awakening mm. where I was incredibly sensitive and aware of each and every moment uh, that was in front oh of God. me. And I know that when I can help people come into the present moment, then I can help them find that still, quiet voice within themselves and to help them remember that all the answers are inside of them. So all of our gifts are inside of us, just waiting for us to still the mind and open the heart. Mm. And that's when we're able to access all the answers of the universe, really. They're all there for each and every one really? of us. So meditation is very, very important. And all religious and spiritual traditions have meditation as a part of their journey to reach that place of unawakened spirit. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. So our audience <laughs> is probably getting a lot, even just by watching you and, and listening to you talk. Is that... 
<laughs> I hope so. Spot I on. sure hope yes. so. <laughs> so if you were to tell us, tell me a little more about how you would deal with groups. What is... Well, I've, like I said, I've taught meditation to uh, small groups and large groups. I've been um, done keynote speaking yeah. um, and for organizations and for businesses. And I bet you have a website that you I could do. send I do. I have a website, to. Nancy Clasby healing and meditation.com okay and everyone is welcome to go to my website and you can contact me that way mm -hmm. um, I've just recently been working on a new program that I wrote up uh, to reach a lot even an even larger audience to bring meditation and uh, serenity into the workplace and to ease that unconscious tension that exists mm -hmm. in the workplace and it's called serenity works and so that's a program that I'm just getting started with now. I've worked one-on-one -on -one for many years, and I've worked in small and large groups. And I'd like to be able to continue to broaden my audience so that I can bring even a little sliver of what was given to me that day, which is the most important thing that I could give to anyone is to remember that the only thing that we're here for is to give and receive unconditional love. And mm -hmm. we all get to do that in our own unique way. And if I can help even one person remember that is inside of them, then I've done a really good job. That is excellent. <laughs> now, could you share a story when you mentioned one person? I thought, can you share an example of someone that you've helped? You don't have to mention their names, but, but just some kind of a an example of something wonderful that you've done. <laughs> oh, well, every morning when I wake up, I ask my higher power to help me be of service during the day. Mm -hmm. And when I go to sleep at night, I ask um, for the gratitude to pour through me for all that I've been able to do. And really, the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is think like, what can I do to help somebody else? And it doesn't have to be in a big way. Mm -hmm. It can be by smiling at someone, opening a door for someone, um, sending someone a note, a text message, or an email, um, just to continually help people um, throughout the day mm -hmm. to help them remember. I try to bring patience and kindness if I'm standing in a long line um, at the grocery store yeah. or wherever I'm at, I try to bring that sense of peace and serenity to others. Um, and as far as helping one person in particular, um, I think that I have focused a lot on my immediate family. Um, mm -hmm. I have um, ch three children. They're all adults now, 32, 28, and 25. Mm -hmm. And I try to do whatever I can to help them. Um, I have um, had the wonderful experience of having amazing parents and wonderful siblings, my brother and my sister. And I've been enfolded into a family that's really, really supported me and loved me. And so I think that I've tried hard to be a good daughter and a good friend, a good mother, a good wife. Um, certainly my husband has been very supportive of me all these years. I know a lot of people will want to talk to him and say, well, what was it like when that <laughs> happened to her, you know? <laughs> um, and so I feel like I've been very blessed yeah. in so many ways. And certainly my clients, I love my clients. I've loved that I've had the privilege of being in, involved in people's lives, especially a lot of times at the end of their lives or helping uh, women who are trying to get pregnant mm -hmm. to bring creation into the world and then to allow it to gently shift out of the world, out of this material world that we live in. To me, birth and death are equally as exhilarating. So I think it's a tremendous privilege for me to be able to be in people's lives in that way as mm -hmm. a facilitator to help them on their path. I think that's wonderful. <laughs> and I, and I, would, I would imagine that a lot of the people that you've helped have this... Um, I guess it's just a feeling of gratitude to know you and to experience your energy and healing and the meditation so that they could get some help out of it. 
and uh, sometimes we're all doubting all of the things that can help us. We don't know if a pill can work. We don't know if, um, you know, a chiropractor can help. But certainly getting the right energy and being with mm -hmm. a positive person must be helpful, yes? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. And, you know, I'm also, I've also had a lot of real life experience at mm -hmm. this point. Um, and so I think that every challenge that I've been given is an opportunity for me to not only create a, a more expanded version of myself, but also to go out and help others. Right. Right. I think I can feel it. <laughs> you know, it's nice being with you. I, I'm sure, you know, I, I'm thinking about some of the people that I am with on many occasions that the energy isn't so good and you want to run the other way. So <laughs> being with the right energy level and, and making that happen within yourself is really, really important. So uh, I know we've talked about a million things, but <clears throat> I liked, I'd like to like better understand how you're dealing with what you have and how you want to reach out to the world. Right. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to take a little sip of water. Absolutely. Let's have a drink. <laughs> well, I know I've said it before, but I do feel like this was a gift that was given to me. Mm -hmm. I didn't ask for it. I didn't know it existed. And I would say the first couple of years that I had uh, was living with this gift, I kept thinking, oh, no, <laughs> this is a huge responsibility. What am I supposed to do with this gift? But at each corner, each bend in the road, uh, people presented themselves to me. Experiences mm -hmm. and situations presented themselves to me. And I was able to expand on the gift that I was given. And the next part of my life, like I said, I'm 61. I'd like to spend the next 15 or 20 years really trying to reach a broader audience mm -hmm. with a message of hope that there is indeed something much greater out there that moves the universe. It's bigger than anything we could imagine with our little pea-sized brains. It's beyond our, our sight, the senses that we use here, our vision, our sense of smell, our language, our, our hearing. It's, it's expanded outside of the box of space and time. And if I can bring people to that place mm -hmm. and allow them to remember their goodness, their kindness, their generosity, their creativity, their sense of humor, then I will have done a good job. Yes, you will. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> I think it will be great. I, I also... I'm feeling, um, as I'm listening to you, I keep on coming up with other questions that I have yeah. about your <clears throat> energy and how you can feel other people. And I, I know you even mentioned that you could feel through animals and plants and trees. I'm really tied to the energy in the world and how that makes me feel, just watching a sunset mm -hmm. or a sunrise or even being in a thunder and lightning storm and feeling that kind of intense energy from the universe, which is sort of how I'm feeling that experience <laughs> you had might have been. And when you do yoga, you know, the, they, we talk about that energy coming in through the top of your head. Mm -hmm. so, so how are you dealing with what you, the energy from other people just on a day-to-day -day yeah. basis. Well, one of the things that I have to do is I have to make sure that I take really good care of myself, mm -hmm. that I have to make sure that I eat the right things. I was born a vegetarian, so when I was a little girl, my mother used to try and feed me meat, and I would spit it back out at her. Good thing. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I have to eat well, and I can actually see energy fields around things. So it looks like the expansion and the contraction, it goes in and out and vibrates. And so I try to eat organically when I can because if you put an, an organic apple and an apple that's been covered in pesticides, I can see the difference in the shine. Seriously? 
and the color and the energy. So I try to eat well. I try to sleep well. I meditate mm -hmm. uh, sometimes four to eight hours a day, depending, because I meditate with my clients. Um, so meditation has been very important for me to sit in stillness, to be surrounded by beauty, mm. surrounded by nature, being out in nature, to listen to thunderstorms, to listen to the silence before the snowstorm starts, mm. um, to be able to sit and listen to my own breathing or another person's breathing. Um, one of my favorite experiences that I remember from when my kids were little was we had gone to um, a place, a vacation place, and we were all sleeping in the same room, and I could hear everyone's breath all night long. I stayed up all night long just listening to their breathing, um, and that to me is a little slice of heaven. So it's important. Self-care is very important, and like I mentioned earlier, if we don't love ourselves, it's very hard to go out into the world and love others. So to con have a practice, a spiritual practice, or a religious practice, or anything that sings to you that makes you feel whole and complete. I remember after the awakening for the first time, when I finally found my way home after that awakening, I looked in the mirror and for the very first time, I saw the light coming out of my own eyes. And I could see how spectacular that light was. And then I realized that it was me that I was seeing. <laughs> I was seeing that energy that we call God that was coming through my eyes. And I realized that I had the opportunity to share that with others. Oh, Nancy, this is so beautiful. <laughs> really, I can't even tell you what this half hour with you has been be like for me. And I'm, I'm hoping that our audience has picked up on this positive energy because this is the way the world should be. This is a beautiful message. It's a beautiful gift that you have been given. And now you're sharing it with the world. And I hope that people will get a lot out of just listening to you, listening to your story, and maybe taking on a little bit of that for themselves and smelling the roses and, you know, going out and really experiencing life with a positive attitude and just, you know, being present. Yes, I would like to say life is very, very short. We think it's long, but it's yeah. very short. So go out and live your life. Love as many people as you can. Allow yourself to be loved in every way possible. Mm -hmm. And I'm really looking forward to meeting as many of you as I am able to. Why don't you give them your website one <laughs> more time, Nancy? <laughs> it's uh, Nancy Clasby, healingandmeditation.com. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Roberta. I really feel good. <laughs> and I thank you so much for your book. I will be rereading it now that we've met in person. And I also want to thank our audience. This is Roberta Chaitis once again. Get your voice out there, and we'll be back with another, another guest someday soon. Okay, thank I you. love you, Roberta. Thank you. <laughs> I love you, too.